This is the 15-3 uh, podcast on uh, Newton's, uh, Newton's, uh, I'm sorry, not Newton, Darwin, <laughs> getting my physics and biology mix up, where Darwin presents his case. And the first thing we're, with the interest grabber that we see is talking about how uh, related living things can have... Uh, um, show that they had a common ancestor and that they are related by um, their by their DNA as we know now. And the uh, first thing it points out is that your cat kind of looks like a lion and we know that they are related. They're part of the same <coughs> excuse me, same type of animal. So looking at this, if you look at um, mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and insects, and um, look at the um, look at animals that if they have legs, if they have fins, if they have wings, um, see how relate you can see how related they are, and it's really easy to see that a fish is very closely related uh, to a amphibian as opposed to being um, related to a bird and um, from this you can see these relationships so let's look at the outline this outline is not exactly um, the way I'm going to run it if you look up above the at the top of each slide you'll see um, kind of what each section is but I cover pretty much everything here so let's start with Darwin that's an actual picture of Darwin's uh, a page of the origin of species which is the book that he wrote that told the world his ideas on evolution and the point here is with this first slide is that he was kind of reluctant this was very controversial and he knew it was going to create quite the stir because it was a very radical idea that he was about to present but he knew that another scientist Alfred Russell Wallace had the same ideas and he was uh, starting to publish his ideas so Darwin knew he had to beat him to it and he started publishing uh, his uh, ideas in the origin of species and he and uh, Wallace were actually uh, <coughs> very cordial colleagues and they corresponded and and really worked and didn't necessarily work together as much as they shared ideas with each other and they were they really helped each other out so let's get let's start talking about what he presented and first thing to understand is that he noticed that there was variation among animals and I chose this picture of giraffe to show you all kinds of different colors and sizes of spots and and on top of that you'd probably find giraffes with different length necks and different length legs and <coughs> what Darwin saw was that there was a variation between animals all in in uh, life, and uh, th farmers knew this from having plants that produced bigger fruit or cows that produced better milk. And you know, we we know among ourselves, we know that some of us are faster or stronger or smarter. Um, so Darwin noticed that there were these variations. <clears throat> Darwin also looked at artificial selection. He knew that uh, animals were bred, um, animals that, that had the traits desired were allowed to breed, and animals that didn't have the traits desired weren't bred. For instance, let's go back to the cow. The cow was bred um, that produced more milk than the cow that didn't produce a lot of milk. They wanted another cow that produced a lot of milk. Um, the picture I chose here is a picture of a wolf showing that over time the, the wolf was is a common ancestor of all these dogs but over time people bred the dogs for the traits that they really wanted in the dog and a lot of dogs historically have jobs and they were bred for the specific of those jobs and if the dog didn't have the trait that was desired, it wasn't allowed to bred. The dog that had the trait w was bred. <coughs> so, um, here's another example, and I love this example. Um, this is the Brassica 
Alamesia plant. It's a, that's the ancestor. And from that, breeders took that one plant, and from it, they would select plants that had, say, the um, the best leaves, the biggest, broadest leaves. And as a result, they ended up making kale, where they bred it for the flower clusters. And as a result, you end up with cauliflower. Or um, you might... Uh, might um, breed it for the lateral buds in this case and then you have Brussels sprouts so here's another example of artificial selection so here's kind of an overall look at Darwin's theory he thought uh, that nature followed the same idea that art uh, that it with as with artificial selection that animals were chosen to keep on breeding and pass on those traits and ones that didn't have the traits that were wanted were um, were then eliminated from the population and don't breed. And nature did this itself. And this diagram here, I think, illustrates that in that um, the there's variation, which is what we're showing here with the different colored dots. There's a common ancestor. And that um, you have these different mutations. And the mutations that work out, they continue to breed. And if they are um, if they are allowed to live, then they pass it on to their offspring here. And that was really what Darwin was talking about. All right, so let's look at the ideas, go through it step by step. The first thing that Darwin said is that more offspring are produced than can survive and reproduce. This is a wolf spider and if you look right here you can see all these little baby spiders and we know very well not all of them are going to able to survive and reproduce. I think uh, I think the, the odds are like one in a thousand or one in uh, several hundred survive and then are able to pass reproduce survive and reproduce. And in the wild I mean the what like uh, the wild is is cruel. Um, there are little there are animals struggling to survive everywhere and they're starving or being eaten or being caught by a parasite or you know dying of cause they have a weak heart or something and not everybody gets to survive so there's all and part of the reason why they don't survive is that there's a competition for limited resources such as water um, such as food um, they're struggling to um, get away from a predator and uh, the resources uh, cause this stress on them and the ones that are best able to survive in this environment are able to, and reproduce are the ones that are going to be most successful so what we call this is survival of the fittest and fin fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce in a specific environment and I like this picture it's in your textbook this um, it's all about the porcupine here who's being threatened by a pretty, um, uh, maybe a pretty formidable predator, and that's a, a lion. And for the point in the book was is that for some species, let's say to get away from a lion, you might run fast, or you might be smart, or you might have good eyesight, or you might have behavioral characteristics um, when you or in your herd that help you survive or you might just have little quills that help you survive and these all are um, traits that lead to your fitness so um, now the, the what ends up this is all comes from what we call adapt adaptations or characteristics that increase an organism's chance of survival and I chose this out because the the um, diagram has some great points on it. Um, owls, you've probably seen, have really large eyes. They're forward, um, great depth perception, and they are really sensitive to low light. Those are all great adaptations for finding prey. S uh, their wings are very silent. They're, um, uh, they really don't make any sound when they fly. Another great adaptation to sneak up on your prey. Sharp talons and uh, and the flexibility in their necks all help them hunt and these are adaptations that make an owl an excellent hunter 
Now, as a result of this, those are able to survive, those are the fittest, then are able to reproduce and pass on those traits to their offspring. And this is true not only for the mighty lion, but it's also true for um, even small little mammals or, or, or bacteria or trees or nearly a fish, nearly anything you can think of has to pass this fitness uh, test to become the fittest and be able to pass on their characteristics to their offspring. So as time goes on, organisms evolve and they, became, they change because the characteristics that are not useful um, are lost. Characteristics that become useful are kept. Um, this diagram is about the evolution of, of horses and you can see at the very bottom that this is a very small horse-like animal and in the end it did end up leading to our current uh, horse here and which you can see has gotten bigger and stronger and probably fat, presumably faster and one of the reasons why also is the way that the legs ha uh, the toes have evolved specifically here it's very hard to see here they have very splayed toes which doesn't really lend itself to speed a horse now has a hoof which really lends itself to for its speed <coughs> So, um, you could probably tell from that last slide that as organisms evolve, they might even branch off, and that in the end we're all evolved from a common uh, ancestor. And this is, you are, species are descended with modification from an ancestral species that lived in the past, meaning they were, came from that species, but over time they've been changed, they've been modified. To, um, to become a more fitter uh, species. Um, and the idea from that then is that all organisms probably came from a common uh, organism. This is called the principle of common descent. All species came from common ancestors. And I mean, you could see that with, uh, with the primates, with the apes, monkeys, gorillas, gibbons and even humans you could see that we probably had a common ancestor because we look very much alike you could see that with nearly a cheetah a lion a jaguar they all sort of look like cats so they probably have a common um, dis, uh, ancestor and this is Darwin's actual drawing in one of his notebooks that illustrates the same kind of tree of life and here you can see a more modern uh, picture of it so